back here at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York for Atlantic 10 Men's Basketball Media Days. And I am joined right now by the head coach of the University of Massachusetts Minutemen, Derek Kellogg. First of all, Coach Kellogg, thank you so very much for joining us. NCAA tournament last year. We were here last year talking about how you wanted to ready this team for a possible NCAA tournament run. You made the NCAA tournament. How would you uh, describe and summarize the 2013-2014 season? Well, I thought it was a great uh, opportunity for our program to uh, take that next step to be an NCAA tournament level team. I was grateful to have uh, such a great senior class in our uh, Brooklyn's own Chaz Williams, uh, Raphael Putney, and Samson Carter. And, um, you know, now it's up to the guys that are still uh, in the program to try to, you know, carry on and build upon the legacy that I thought I thought those guys left at UMass. And, um, you know, last year at this time, I felt really good about being uh, where we were. And this year, I feel good about uh, the same. Uh, we're a little bit younger. we got some guys that still have to learn, but I feel good about our team and our program. Describe the differences between playing in the NCAA tournament and coaching in the NCAA tournament. It seems much more nerve-wracking as a coach. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a little less control uh, when you're when you're kind of coaching as a player. But I'll tell you what, both of them are great. Uh, it's the uh, one of the greatest things in college sports is uh, playing and coaching in the NCAA tournament. It was uh, it was amazing for us to hear our UMass name called as a player, and, and even more so as a coach, to bring kind of the UMass name back on a national stage. And it's something that once you've been there as a coach, that you cherish to get get there again. And uh, that's a, kind of a goal of ours is to be an NCAA tournament level team and program every year. It's almost similar to the time that you played at UMass. It was yourself and Michael Williams in the backcourt doing well, almost getting to the Final Four. And then after you guys leave, Padilla, Travieso come in the backcourt. They make the Final Four. Are you hoping for the same deal again with the people coming in to replace some of those players? Well, it's great that uh, you reminded me that I never played in the Final <laughs> Four. But now the reality of it is, is um, you know, hopefully the guys set the tone for how hard you work, the style of play, the UMass basketball basketball brand, our pain on offense and defense that now when the new guys come in, the, the kind of torch bearers left the, uh, left the grill for the guys that they realize that we play at a certain level to take this program to the next level. And now our goal of ours is to, um, to try to get to the next level, to get to the NCAA tournament, to win a game and do something special like Dayton was able to do last year. Uh, you mentioned going back to the NCAA tournament and looking at the schedule. Boston College, Manhattan, Notre That's Dame. Enough. <laughs> okay. No, it's not enough. Florida State, at Harvard, at BYU, at LSU, at Providence. Is there any game I'm missing in terms of the non-conference? Um, this is probably one of the most brutal schedules, the most brutal schedule in the country, one of the most brutal schedules in the country. Are you a masochist? That's what I keep hearing. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things is we, um, we, we had a great schedule last year at home and um, really kind of geared for that team for an NCAA tournament level berth, not uh, realizing that at some point I would have to return the LSU, the BYU, the Providence, the Harvard games to, to play uh, Boston College on a neutral site, uh, Notre Dame and Florida State. Then you have Iona, Manhattan, Siena, um, teams that are very, very good teams. Northeastern that are supposed to win their conference, Florida Gulf Coast, so and even Canisius. So the, the schedule is probably one of the toughest in the, in the country, but what it's going to do is give us a, a great RPI. It gives us a chance for a lot of NCAA tournament level wins, and it finds out what kind of team we have pretty early in the season. Uh, one of your players, Caddy Lalane, really came on. You know, he's had um, injury problems before. Uh, what do you expect from him in uh, this in this season? Well, I'm, I'm pretty candid with Caddy on a daily basis. I expect him to be one of the best, bigger guys in the country. You know, I've looked at some magazines and some different things that told him, you're not rated as one of the top 20 power forwards or centers in the country. And I watched you play against Johnny O'Brien. I watched you play against New Mexico. I've watched you against some of the best big guys in the league in the, in the country when you're on your game and want to play. So I expect Caddy to be a double-double guy and be one of the best, bigger players in the country. Talk about uh, your motivational tactics. As you mentioned, is he someone that gets motivated by uh, listening to you uh, saying stuff like that? Well, I hope so <laughs> because uh, we're going to need him. And, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot at stake for not only Caddy while he's at UMass but also for his future to look at, you know, where you want to be in two, three, four, five years. Um, so between him and, you know, Maxi Escho, my other big guy senior, I expect those two guys to be one of the best front courts in our league and, and hopefully in the country. Describe Maxi Escho's game. He's one of those really long players, can pretty much fit in any space and do a whole lot of things. Is he your most versatile player on the team? Well, what I like is he's somewhat underrated because he didn't start last year. He came off the bench, and I, and I think he – at times got lost in the shuffle with Putney and Sampson, and now he has that opportunity that he's been waiting for. So I'm, I'm anticipating his numbers to go up, his productivity to be even higher, and for him to be a guy who's uh, the leader of our team with his energy, his intensity, his enthusiasm, and, and where he's great is on the front of that press. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And uh, I do want to talk about one other player, uh, Derek Gordon, yes. very good player, and earlier uh, this year came out with his uh, sexual identity as well. Uh, how did that process uh, turn about? Did he come to you? Did he come to the team? And uh, 
um, just talk about the support that you showed uh, Derek uh, during this very monumental time in his life for him. Well, I think it was a great time for Derek and also for our team to um, be very supportive of um, you know Derek and, and his decision to uh, to come out publicly. Um, our guys on the team were were very supportive of him. I think um, as the head coach, uh, we were just there to love Derek, to realize that he's a great young man, a great player, a great person, and if he's happy. Uh, which he seems to be very happy now that I, I'm happy with this decision, and I think the guys on their team are happy for him. Uh, did you notice that he wasn't as happy as he is now before? Uh, you know, I, it seems to me that he's more um, comfortable around his teammates, that he spent a lot more time with the guys, and he does seem to be walking around with a big smile on his face. So, uh, you know, if that's the case, like I said, I, I'm very happy for Derek. Former UMass player, UMass coach, maybe masochist, Derek <laughs> Kellogg. Thank you so very much for joining us. Best of luck and success to you this season. Thank you very much.